Hello and welcome everyone to today's um, session on sustainable food choices uh, from crop, crop cultivation to global food security and individual eating choices. So sustainable food choices. You've all come to this session today because I presume you want to hear something around why we might want to think about the food that we eat in a rapidly changing world. And there's a couple of things that I'd like to set out at the start about that changing world that really highlight the urgency of why we might need to make those choices. First of all, climate change. This infographic shows how global temperatures have changed since 1850. This never fails to focus my mind when I'm thinking about these type of problems. Um, it's pretty scary. The second thing I wanted to show you is this plot which is around biodiversity loss. So this is a plot that was published this year as part of this year's Living Planet Report. And what it shows is change in abundance of vertebrate populations globally since 1970. And as you can see, 68%, there's been a 68% decline in the size of vertebrate populations since 1970. And that's huge. And much of that would have been driven by habitat loss, due to land use change which brings me on to the third point which is that those two things are scary and urgent but they are really symptoms of our relationship with land and how we use land for different purposes which brings me on to this final point of global food security given all of these changes that are happening happening around us as a human society we need to think about where we are going to get our food from What's the most efficient way to get our food? What food can we eat that is much, much better for all sorts of bi for biodiversity in multiple different ways? Um, I think it's important to remember that global food supply chains have become global and deeply complex. Um, and there's variation in how we produce and consume food around the world, not to mention the public policy choices um, that exist for different um, communities around the world. Finally, there's also been a huge thing this year, which is the disruption from COVID, which has certainly made me re-examine some of my choices around food, um, watching there being supermarkets with no food in them or much more limited choice. Um, we've got an excellent panel for you today to discuss these issues. Um, I'm going to be really pleased to introduce to you uh, Dr. Nazia Habib, Professor Andrew Barnford and Dr. Helen Ann Curry. Um, I'm Amy Monroe Four. Um, I currently work at Cambridge Zero um, and I was heavily involved in developing the university's own sustainable food policy um, and was lucky enough to work with a couple of very talented students on assessing the environmental impact that, that policy had. Um, I also graduated from Homerton in Natural Sciences in 2011. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Nazia Habib, um, who's going to tell you a little bit more about herself and the food choices that we face. Thank you, Amy. It's a pleasure to be in this amazing festival because I'm a uh, alumni myself from this university. And uh, when I think about it, years do go by very, very fast. Uh, from one side, sitting on the desk, listening to lectures and imagining what I would do when I grow up. And the other hand, and now I'm trying to inspire other young students and fellows to follow the future journey that they have lined up for them. Talking of journey, I just recently became a mother and if I had choice, I would have breastfed my baby to give her the first food. But guess what? Food security is such a thing that it's not always something that we can control, nor should we think to control. My baby is a nine month old baby and she is 100% formula fed baby. This COVID-19 has really done a tremendous um, awareness rising for me as well, Amy, because what happened in our three months um, old baby that suddenly COVID hit and she ran out of formula. And she is also a reflux baby and we had no choice but to depend on anti reflux formulas. And in London, where I live currently, no supermarket at that time had the formula left on their shelves. Food security has been challenged in such a way that at a household level, at mid in middle income country family, we did not think that I would actually experience it at a household level, a topic that I have been studying for over a decade. 
the reason I've been studying this because I'm from Bangladesh and I have grew up in an environment where I know what food security is like at a household level. I thought I escaped it. But with COVID-19, I'm back at realizing what household level food security can look like and how selectively it can affect a different member of the family when you're looking at food security issue. Food security, I have looked at it very much at a policy level and I have also considered it at a very household level, but never at a level of choice function. And choice is something as an economist that I have trained in in Cambridge. I have learned to understand that it is an option. Only few are lucky in the world to have that option. And that option in the context of food system means four critical things. Access, quality of food, quantity of food, and stability of food. If we do not have all these four aspects of food in the function of choice, i.e. I have the choice to give my baby a high quality regular milk and not get hard, you know, throw up every five seconds, that is a choice that I can opt, uh, opt into and say I am food secure. But unfortunately, that's not the case. So this is where there comes the capacity or the capability of the individual. And you can scale it up all the way at the system level. So the next bit, what I do now, is actually I am a food security researcher, but from a food system level. And I run a research program at Cambridge on resilience and sustainable development. Food being one of my core expertise in this research program, we actually work with developing countries and try to investigate the way their food system has been developed over the years and have to what extent they have actually considered both individual level to system level capability, access and stability to address sudden disruptions that the system can have. COVID-19 has really put a test to that kind of hypothesis based on which we do our research. But on top of that, ongoing financial crisis and climate change has definitely put another level of ongoing and persistent challenge that we have been facing in the, in the era of um, 21st century. So together, all that three challenges, I, I believe this, is, this session is very important for us to reassert what food system do really means and what kind of food choice we want to have going forward in the future. I'll stop here, thank you. Thank you very much, Nazia. Um, for a slightly different perspective, I'd now like to hand over to Professor Andrew Bamford. Thank you, I'm um, uh, a conservation scientist, I'm a professor of conservation science in the zoology department in Cambridge. And as Amy was saying in her introduction, growing and processing the food uh, that we eat has a greater impact on the climate and on biodiversity and indeed on the availability of fresh water than any other human activity by a considerable margin. I'm going to spend just a few minutes going over four suggestions from my own uh, group's research work and from the literature uh, of I ideas about how we can change our behavior, how we can make choices as individuals, uh, as businesses in terms of policy that might help lower uh, various aspects of that footprint. First, perhaps uh, one of the most uh, obvious things we might do is to think about cutting uh, waste. We've seen some progress in recent years, but in broad terms, uh, regardless of where you are in the world, somewhere between a third and a half of all food that's grown never reaches uh, somebody's mouth. It's wasted uh, on the way. What can we do about it? Uh, well, at uh, the uh, consumer and at the retail level, uh, we could try to reduce the amount of food that people unne buy unnecessarily and then waste uh, through things like uh, eliminating buy one get one free uh, offers and by more thoughtful approach uh, to best before uh, dates. At the level of uh, restaurants, uh, we can be thinking about reducing uh, plate sizes and portion sizes, which saves people money uh, as well as saves waste. And more systemically, we can be thinking uh, about reducing in the UK, about sorry, rein reinstating in the UK, perhaps uh, the use of uh, food waste as feed for pigs. That's something we always used to do until the 2001 foot and mouth outbreak. Uh, and although we uh, then banned food waste uh, being fed to pigs, lots of other countries, Japan and South Korea in particular, didn't. They just tightened up the restrictions. And as a result, uh, the regulations around it, and as a result, have, have carried on using uh, food waste uh, for pigs very effectively. Uh, 
Uh, for my second idea, I want you to think um, just for a moment uh, about how many of you, whether you've ever eaten knowingly an endangered species. And then I want to show you this. This is um, the very familiar cod, uh, which is rated by the IUCN, International Union for Conservation of Nature, uh, as being as likely to go extinct uh, in uh, the course of the next century as the Atlantic elephant. Uh, sorry, it's the African <laughs> um, And uh, uh, so, so you, many of you probably have uh, eaten an endangered species uh, recently. I, I certainly have. Moving on just from uh, endangered species to, to fish stocks uh, more generally, uh, this plot from the Food and Agricultural Organization summarizes the state of uh, the world's fisheries back through back since uh, 1975. And you can see very clearly there's been an increase uh, in the level of exploitation of the world's fish stocks such that now more than 90% of all monitored fish stocks are either overfished already or are fished right up to their sustainable limits. What can we do about that? Well, if we're serious about maintaining marine biodiversity, uh, we're probably going to have to greatly reduce our consumption of wild caught fish. Where we do eat wild caught fish, we should perhaps be looking for evidence such as uh, the tick of the Marine Stewardship Council that shows that the fish that we're eating uh, does come from a sustainably managed uh, source. And uh, uh, perhaps we should be uh, looking to increase uh, our use instead of uh, farmed fish and, uh, and, 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 sea and uh, shellfish. Uh, that generally has a much lower footprint, though not in some cases. And so, for instance, we should probably be cautious about eating prawns, uh, whose aquaculture is often linked to mangrove clearance, and salmon because salmon is a predatory fish uh, which uh, whose cultivation requires the continued extraction of large amounts of feed fish uh, from the wild. Third and perhaps most importantly of all we need to cut our consumption of meat and dairy. This is a plot summarizing the greenhouse gas footprint of different uh, protein sources. It's clearly far greater uh, for meat and dairy than for plant-based alternatives. For the average American family, for example, uh, the emissions associated with the meat they eat are considerably more than the, the emissions from their flying uh, behavior. Uh, and uh, they're roughly seven times as great as the emissions uh, associated with getting uh, the food that they eat to the table. So uh, what you eat is far more important than uh, where, it, uh, where it comes from. Ruminant meat in particular has an especially high uh, footprint. This pattern is for greenhouse gases, but the result's pretty similar if you look at other aspects uh, of our environmental footprint. There are many options here for what we might do. We might cut out ruminant meat uh, entirely. We might do so partly. For catering outlets, that might mean uh, we need to cut uh, the number of meat-based meals on offer, but importantly, also increase the diversity and the appeal of vegetarian uh, alternatives. And we can also uh, still eat meat meals, of course, but reduce how much is used in any uh, given uh, recipe. Last, we perhaps need to think about how whatever food we do eat is produced, and in particular, what that means for how much land is used to grow uh, the, uh, the, what we need to eat, because land is central to the impacts of food production on biodiversity. I'm just gonna show you two uh, extremes uh, here. Uh, which look at farming at different levels of yield, that's production per unit area. So what we might do is share our farmed landscapes uh, with uh, wildlife. Uh, if we do that, the, slight, the, the problem is that uh, that will reduce farm yield, so we'll need to farm a larger area in total uh, to be able to meet food demand. The other extreme is what's called a land sparing approach where we might seek to increase yields on uh, the land that we do farm, thereby meeting demand on a smaller total area and potentially freeing up land uh, to be retained or restored as uh, natural habitats. We've been working on this problem for uh, almost a decade now uh, on seven different, uh, in seven different countries and the results we've We've, uh, we, we, we've discovered have been remarkably consistent in that across all those places, uh, biodiversity and carbon uh, would be more prevalent across the landscape as a whole if we go down the right hand uh, approach of high yield farming linked to setting aside areas uh, of, uh, of land for, uh, for largely for nature. What does that mean in terms of our choices again? Well, uh, first, I think it means uh, that at a, at a policy level, there's a premium on finding sustainable ways 
of increasing farm yields. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, intensive farming business as usual. We're not arguing uh, for that. And there are some very interesting programs in Cambridge underway uh, exploring ways of uh, increasing the yields of existing production systems in ways that are sustainable. And second, it means that as consumers, we might be a little cautious uh, when we see products being advertised as environmentally friendly, where that may mean that they've been produced at lower yields and so require more land uh, to be produced. They may not, uh, because of that, be as environmentally friendly as we first uh, think. The exciting news is that most of these ideas are being put into practice already uh, in Cambridge through the sustainable food policy that Amy mentioned uh, at the start of the afternoon. This was introduced by uh, the University Catering Service in 2016-2017 and it's been a remarkable and award-winning success for the university. So since its introduction, uh, the University Catering Service has cut its food waste by uh, 6%. It's been making moves to reduce uh, its use of fish and in particular of fish from potentially non-sustainable uh, sources. And critically, it's removed ruminant meat from uh, the menus uh, in all the university catering service outlets. And as a result, over that time, seen a 33% decrease in uh, the emissions uh, of the food it serves per kilo, a 28% uh, reduction in the land use that's associated with that. And all that's happened while there's been a 33% increase in the amount of food uh, that people are buying. Uh, so it's certainly these changes haven't been uh, putting people uh, off, their, off, off their dinner. So to sum up, um, what I wanted to say at the start here, the footprint of the food we eat is very considerable and it can seem daunting, I think, uh, working out how we address that. But there are choices we can make at multiple different levels, including choices that each of us can make as individuals, which can help us move towards meeting future food demand at least cost uh, to the rest of the planet. Uh, thank you all. Great, thank you, Andrew. Um, and for a final perspective, I'd like to ask Dr. Helen Ann Curry uh, to give us her perspective from the perspective of um, crops and studying the history of them. Thank you, Helen. Great, thank you very much, Amy. Um, I'm really pleased to be a part of this panel. And I think as you'll discover shortly, I bring a really different perspective. Uh, I'm a historian of science and technology. I focus especially on uh, recent uh, agricultural science, recent environmental science. And so the, the comments that I'm gonna make really come from that historical perspective, uh, thinking about what it means to, to make individual choices about food uh, in relation to a, a longer history. So as I'm sure everybody is, is aware, the 20th century saw really huge changes in terms of how our food is produced in many different parts of the world. And since I've been specifically studying historical changes in the kinds of crops that we grow, I'm just going to focus on that uh, and, and say a little bit about how this relates to choices that we make with, re with respect to food and agriculture. So if we look at global data, we know that worldwide in the past 50 to 70 years or so, national diets on the whole around the world have tended to include a, a greater diversity of crop species. So people have access to and consume more different uh, kinds of grain, fruits, and vegetables. So you might think, for example, about your own family's diet over generations, right? Do you have access to foods that your parents didn't, even if you are in the same geographical place? Uh, thinking about my own life, I can say that I know my parents didn't grow up eating quinoa. Uh, I certainly didn't grow up eating quinoa, but my nieces and nephews in the U.S., uh, they do, right? And, and I think we all have these kinds of examples of the, the ways in which uh, the exchange of crop plants and the global development of agriculture and, and markets has really expanded the diversity of foods that we encounter regularly. Uh, and this is true to, to different extents in, in, in most countries in the world, right? Uh, and so diets at a national level have diversified uh, along these axes. At the same time that, that the, the range of foods that the, the uh, average individual encounters have uh, increased in some ways, um, it is also the case that diets the world over in that same 50 to 70, 70 year period have become more the same, uh, more the same irrespective of where you are in the world. So of the um, 200,000 or more different food plants that humans have been known to eat, 
Uh, we now limited ourselves to more or less 200, uh, and actually less is the operative word there. More than 50% of our global calories and protein come from just three crops, from, from maize, uh, wheat, and rice. Uh, and so, although I mentioned this diversification at, at one level, at, at the, the kind of national diet level, uh, what we really see globally is an increasing monotonization uh, uh, of diets. And if we dive down uh, to the species level uh, in terms of uh, those diets to look, or sorry, below the species level to look at, at crop varieties, we see a further monotonization at work. So the demands of industrial food production, of uh, industrial crop uh, cultivation, processing, these all demand a certain kind of uniformity in product. And, and farmers are really encouraged to provide that uniformity by growing crops that are as uniform as possible, as predictable as possible. And this is really a feature um, that is created by closely controlling the genetic makeup of crops. If you're at all attuned to uh, weaknesses in the industrial food system, and I'm sure that, that many of you listening in are, uh, then you'll be familiar with stories that appear fairly often in the news about dwindling or disappearing crop diversity. Um, for example, about apple varieties uh, 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 disappearing or um, old kinds of corn or rice or wheat. Um, Farmers around the world, uh, as we learn from news stories, are planting more of the same variety of wheat or potato than they ever have before. Uh, you might uh, associate this with the proliferation of genetically uniform industrial monocrops and the concomitant uh, loss of all the diverse varieties of the past. So these stories are, they're contested by different people, but they're also very consistent. Um, and now thinking of a his, as, a, as a historian, I can say, looking back, they're also really consistent over time. Uh, people have actually been talking about and worrying about the loss of crop diversity since the 1890s uh, for uh, 130 years. Uh, and that is something that uh, the, the scale of concern about the loss of cr uh, crop diversity has really roughly mapped onto to two different trends. Uh, one of those is the increasing power of scientists, of plant breeders in particular, uh, and the second is the increasing power of, of private seed companies. And so for the rest of the, the talk, I'm just going to talk about those two uh, shifts and then come around to what it has to do with the choices that we make. So first, thinking about genetics and science, as the knowledge of genetics has made breeders uh, ever more capable in their transformation of crop plant characteristics, those breeders' products, which is to say new crop varieties, uh, have traveled further. Uh, breeders' varieties, displaced farmers' varieties, that is to say local varieties, in more and more different parts of the world. Now, at the start of the 20th century, most plant breeders were in fact state employees. They were public servants, uh, and they were linked to increasingly robust systems of public research. Although those breeders didn't always succeed in serving diverse national interests, they did generally recognize a responsibility for responding to diverse, diverse kinds of demands that farmers in their, um, uh, in their country would have. So different regions of a country might have different environmental contexts that require different, different crops. And this was actually one justification for the quite large scale of, of many national agricultural research systems. By comparison, in the early 20th century, most seed companies were small. They were mom and pop outfits that um, mostly actually just redistributed things that were made by government uh, breeders. Now, fast forward to the 21st century, to today. Uh, what do we see? Today, plant breeders have very, very powerful tools at their disposal, not just genetic engineering or, or genome editing, but genomic al uh, analyses. They have access to, to very large storehouses of genetic diversity. However, they are often not today public servants. Uh, in Britain, Europe, the United States, and, and other parts of the world, uh, once robust systems of public agricultural research have actually been slowly dismantled. So here in the UK, one sign of that is that the immensely successful public uh, plant breeding institute was sold off to, to private industry in 1987 and, and has never been uh, restored. By comparison, 
private seed companies have become vastly more powerful. So today, just four companies control about 60% of the global seed market. And although it may benefit those companies to some extent to respond to diverse constituents, their central concern for good reason is the bottom line. Uh, and that bottom line is, is typically served best by keeping the product line to, to uh, the minimum necessary. And this is a large part of the explanation for why worries about the loss of crop diversity uh, is really greater now than at any time in that past period of 130 years that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so given that history, what is it that we can do? I think most people in their desire to do something about the loss of crop diversity turn to the idea of heritage or heirloom varieties. This is obviously fine, this kind of looking backward and, and trying to restore those types, but I think it's also really quite limited. Um, for one, it's limited because I think for the most part it relies on uh, uh, or it places the responsibility on the consumer and individual consumer choices only have so much power. I think it's also limited because plant breeders have an incredible array of tools and knowledge for developing new and better crops at their disposal. They just happen to be chained into a system that really uh, does not respond to calls for diversity. So a powerful step towards um, really upending that power would be to insist on government reinvestment in public breeding at a, at a much greater scale than we do now. Uh, and, and, and with that, an insistence on research that could respond more to growers and eaters and potentially even government's interests in having different foods and different food systems uh, uh, available in the future. So this, um, I think, is the, the, the set of uh, comments that I'll put forward as a, as a historian, and I'm looking forward to the, the cross uh, conversation that follows. Thank you all for those very different takes on what it means to make sustainable food choices and the different things that we need to think about um, in this world. Um, so we've got a few questions now that I'd like to address to all of you. Um, so the first one is starting to think about choices. The theme of this whole session is around choice. So what do you, are the major choices that people are going to need to make about food in the current environment? And this could be at an individual level um, or the kinds of producer, choices that producers or restaurateurs might have to make, or even at a policy, policy making level. And Andrew, could I ask you to kick us off on this one? Um, thanks, Amy. Um, so I think I, I went over ones to, that I think are the most important with, um, from the point of view of addressing the environmental footprint of food. That's not the same as uh, the food security uh, issues that Nazia was, uh, was talking about. And I, I think there are, there are four of those. I mean, there are others, but there are four big ones for me. There are ones around cutting waste, um, uh, around making smart seafood choices, um, uh, around um, reducing uh, ruminant and dairy uh, intake. Uh, and all of those, I think, are things that we need to be thinking about as individuals. I think retail has a huge part, uh, the choices that it makes, the decisions it makes will have a huge part to play in supporting that. And of course, um, policy is also uh, very important. In that context, it's, it's, it's interesting to note that the um, uh, Citizens Climate Change Assembly, which is just reporting its first set of interventions, um, that it, reporting back from a diverse mix of, of society about what it thinks we need to do to meet uh, our Paris commitments, um, put right up there, we need to cut our meat consumption by 20 to 40 percent. Uh, that's something which uh, a government is not going to be uh, very keen to, to, to let, it's not be really brave enough to legislate on, to push policy in the direction of, yet clearly it's what people know they need to do. And so there's a role for policy in there, I think, uh, for policy choices to be able to support people making their private choices. Uh, and then the last one, uh, which I ended on, I think is uh, really again for, for, for policy in particular, but also um, because this isn't just the preserve of government, as, as Helen was just explaining, it's um, very much about what business is doing. Uh, we need to be uh, 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 identifying and then backing uh, sustainable routes to enhancing the yields of what, we, uh, of what we're growing uh, as our food, if we're going to make any space on the rest of the planet uh, for uh, the millions of other species that live here and the uh, and to store the, the carbon that we know needs to be uh, drawn down out of the atmosphere. Thanks. Thank you, Andrew. And Nazia, could I ask you to come in on this from your perspective as well, please? Sure. Thanks, Amy. 
So uh, I'll uh, take on the point from the public policy onward and try to shed a bit of my expertise in there. Um, so I look at the choice as a two for this talk, just to uh, minimize the uh, whole definition of choice. But if we take it just a two very crude version of it, the public choice theory, which is very core to political economics of understanding how democratic principle works and how it influences government's decision. In this case, what Andrew was trying to argue as how, how the government could make a some kind of regulatory framework that will enable uh, basically everyone from household level to all the way restaurant and a producer level reduce waste. Now that goes very much onto that theory of uh, public choice. And there are tools and methodologies, economists have been very good at developing them and trying to understand the ability of the people within a political economic regime that can actually effectively make that change. Now, if you look at the way the world is going in terms of what decision democratic countries are making, whereas it's the UK and the US, uh, forget about the other developing countries who are also democratic, I, I question myself the extent to this narrative uh, uh, stands against the uh, theories that have been suggesting that democratic version of policymaking often takes a, uh, take account of the uh, popular ideas. Now, of course, there are also theories and um, academicians who have been looking at and saying that not all uh, public choice theory based policies are actually looking at the interest of the people as some. So in other cases, the choice the government makes not necessarily are coming through the lens of the people, but through the infrastructure structure that they have. So even if you do not want to eat um, a meat based product is a country and going back to Helen's work on the history of the localization food choices if the country is very much dependent on uh, husbandry economy i.e. Um, uh, cattle ranching and uh, animal based uh, food diet, there will be very limited choice for that particular government to follow the global hype or global trend on going vegetarian. So there are very um, uh, strict and regulatory framework within which different choices get made at a public level. The next one is a crude definition of a choice theory. It's just to look at the individual level or household level choice that one can make. In this case, I bring back my own personal story of not having a choice to feed my baby breast milk over formula. On top of it, within the formula, she only could have one particular type. And that is a choice is what we call capability approach. There is a capability of in among each of us as to what extent we can make a certain choice, no matter how much we want to have a different version of it. So when we're looking at food policy, it goes across from a very individualized version of who we are to all the way where we live. And that dictates the amount of flexibility we have in the spectrum of change. And spectrum of change is something very important for us to understand at this point where we are, when we have compounding challenges that is constraining the choice function. Um, and this is where I come with the uh, re research work that we recently done uh, for Bangladesh government, where we really looked at some of the choices the country has to secure employment for the uh, lower income population. And that is very much core to giving them the ability to just even secure basic food that they would need as the, as the economy is transforming into um, co uh, catching up to industry 4.0, which is supposed to at least have a great advantage for the production. At least this is the pre-COVID-19 scenario, um, but then it has a massive backlash into uh, employment opportunity that it will actually create for the uh, 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 the working force. So just to bring it down to a conclusion, I think it's a very interesting question, but I think the question demands a very nuanced understanding of the choice function within which we are trying to come up with the solution um, for different aspects of, uh, of the uh, society. Thank you for that, Nazia. Um, really, really interesting to hear you both coming at this from two quite different perspectives and how you both arrive at um, actually what it means for an individual to make these choices as well as that and the context within which they exist. Be it for one of you within a policy context and the other perhaps in an environmental context is very fascinating. Um, so moving on, I've got a secondary question we'd like to ask. 
which is how can we better understand the relationship between what we plant and what we eat? Um, and Helen, could I ask you to come in and speak, speak to this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Amy. I think, you know, thinking historically about this relationship between what we plant and what we eat, um, you know, uh, uh, looking backwards in time, we would say that, that um, for, for most of human history, those would have been quite closely related, right? Um, uh, even the fact that we can uh, say, you know, what is the relationship between these things suggests the distance uh, that has happened in the food system between eaters and, and growers, right? Uh, and it's really only at the, at the extremes of privilege uh, in terms of uh, those who are either uh, growing their own food um, um, in a subsistence context or possibly those who are able to buy into local farm production in somewhere like the UK, um, where people have a direct kind of input into the, 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 the relationship between what goes into the ground and what they wish um, uh, kind of immediately to, to put into their bodies. And so um, one of the things for me, I, I mean, listening to, uh, to, to Andrew's comments, for example, I think it's important to think about the ways in which our individual choices maybe push us all collectively towards a position where more people have a choice about um, whether the things that are going into the ground are the things they, they want to be consuming later. Um, but we're going to need also um, kind of transparency and public policy, I think, to push us more towards a middle ground where, where what, we, what we plant and what we eat are actually um, not seen as sort of separate separate um, decisions, right? Um, um, or, or I should say that, that eaters kind of have more of a choice um, um, with respect to what, what agricultural systems produce. Thank you, Helen. And can I ask Nazia to come in and comment on this as well, please? Sure, Amy, thanks. Uh, again, I will bring in uh, my uh, emerging country and public policy perspective to this. So bring, uh, building on what Helen said as to, again, government trying to inspire us what we need to eat. So as I mentioned already, there is only so much um, um, regulatory framework can actually provide as a guidance as to what needs to, what we plant and what we eat, because a lot of it is very dependent on the political history of what we have been eating, for example, what Helen has already mentioned. And the newest version is actually what is valuable. And this is an important part of food um, uh, value system, because you may be one of the country, one of the resident in Senegal, and Senegal's one of the mad, massive uh, uh, benefit uh, into the international market that they're groundnut producers, and that is a high value. Now you cannot live on eating groundnuts all the time. So in this case, a country would still promote groundnut production but may not necessarily have enough um, instrument in its pocket to actually uh, give similar kind of support to smallholders. And that's the kind of story we see in developing countries, that there is a very strong agriculture policy, strong agriculture ministry, but if you dig deeper into the skin of those uh, policies and ministries, you will start to see that they, these are very bifurcated policy. It often tend to promote the plantation of crop that will have higher export value. In those kind of scenarios, you end up in in a in a imbalanced food budget where the import then goes up because the population needs to sustain its uh, uh, daily nutritional requirement. And of course, we know the story of how food insecurity does sit into a country when you have a high dependency on uh, export-based agricultural system and have a very weak uh, uh, national food agriculture system. And, and to bring this point to home, in uh, recently this year, about 160 countries have stopped schools because of COVID-19. World Bank released a report saying that 85% of the uh, children under five who used to depend on the school meal have been actually going into massive food insecurity, i.e. the household could not provide them with enough food, nutritional food, to meet their daily requirements. And this is the kind of uh, scenario where the country, regardless what they plant, 
they cannot ever plant enough of the balanced diet and the enough nutritional basket. So they will have to depend on some alternative version of food um, in, in, uh, integration into the system. So um, to close off, I imagine the uh, in the future, food policy does not necessarily need to sit very in isolation in one ministry or one institution, but it really has to be looked through the whole system of food. All the way from the uh, institution looking at uh, Planned Parenthood, I would imagine, to all the way to the uh, at the multinational level where the trade regimes are set for different kind of food export and imports. Uh, and that's the way I imagine the future needs to go if we really want to have global food resilience and have enough nutritional food to be accessed by everyone, especially the basic ones when time comes to um, like COVID-19 or any other shocks in the future. Thank you. Great, thank you for that. Um, oh, you've actually had a large number of really, really interesting questions come through on the questions and answers. So if it's okay with all the other panelists, I'd like to move over to, to address some of these now because there's some really good ones. Um, so the first one is a question for Andrew, which is, could you expand a little on the difference in the environmental impact of land use versus transportation? Is it more impactful to choose foods that have a greater yield or use less water or more impactful to choose foods that are locally grown. By extension, how important is the overall environmental impact of packaging? In other words, should our main criteria for choosing food in the supermarket be the sustainability of the food itself, how locally it has been packaged, produced, or how little packaging it comes in? That's a really great question. <laughs> There's quite a lot wrapped up in it. I'll be brief and I'm happy to talk, you know, um, offline or some other way uh, with whoever sent that in. Um, uh, that, that, that's a great question. Um, in a nutshell, um, what I've seen of the numbers and the data that we've collected very much think about how the food is produced or what, it, what type of food it is. As I, as I was saying, you know, animal based products tend to have a much higher footprint, not always, but mostly. Um, uh, it's actually how the, how the food has been produced, not where it's come from, nor um, uh, the packaging it's coming in. Those things are important, but they're, they're second order issues, in my view, when you look at the numbers. So, for example, uh, the, environmental, uh, f the, 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 the environmental impact, at least the greenhouse gas impact uh, of uh, a, a meat-based diet versus a plant-based diet, the difference there is seven times the difference of uh, an entirely local diet versus um, a global diet. Uh, so reducing food miles uh, in that sense may be good for all sorts of other reasons, do supporting your local economy, uh, but uh, the environmental impact of that is, is really quite tiny compared with substantially cutting your uh, meat consumption. And likewise with, uh, uh, with packaging, I mean this gets us back to the issue of food waste, I, I, I think, where um, my uh, my expectation, I haven't seen any clear data on that, but my expectation is that the shift, the very dramatic shift away from plastic packaging um, in, in anything in certain contexts has probably uh, had a significant impact on the amount of food waste that we produce. I'm not a fan of plastic per se, but I think it has some things that it's really good at. And one of them is, is, is uh, increasing the shelf life uh, and reducing waste of food uh, in transport. And that's one of the, for me, one of the most likely things that we should carry on using what oil we've got left uh, for. Rather than putting up into the atmosphere, let's use it and keep recycling it as uh, ways of limiting, uh, as, as a fantastic set of um, uh, inventions for, for reducing food waste. So just to go back to the question, uh, I'm most concerned about how my food is produced, what it is and how it's produced. Uh, the footprint that it has on the land and the ec the externalities, the pollution and so forth that it induces in its production, and le much less uh, about how it comes to me, where it's come from, uh, and how it's packaged. Brilliant. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we've got another great question here as well, um, which is, can you comment a little bit on the tension between ethical and environmentally conscious food choices and socioeconomic pressures that might reduce the ability of certain groups to make those choices? Is making those choices in some ways a privilege reserved to more economically advantaged populations? And this is addressed to everyone, but I'd like Nazia to come in on it first, if you're happy with that. Sure, uh, very, very interesting question. Um, 
food is a very um, politicized commodity as much as it is a basic requirement for us to be alive, simply put. When it comes to politicizing anything, it becomes a preferential benefit for a particular group of people over the other. And if you, and I am not a food historian, and I am not going to pretend to I know the whole history of how food has emerged. But if we, as much as my research has gone looking into the historical setting of the food choices between a certain group of population, that is mainly I looked at the South Asian countries uh, narrative. And if you look at what they say is, um, let's take, uh, is edible by a widow when they become widowed in, in Indian culture, there are certain food they cannot consume. And this is a very interesting question when you ask about ethics, because when I was researching from the rights perspective of a woman to food, a widowed woman has just the same amount of nutritional requirement as a woman who was not widowed. But because widowed are seen as a second class citizen, suddenly, as soon as their husband passed away, their food requirement from having any um, meat into their uh, meat or fish or uh, protein into their consumption goes down to nearly zero. Now, this is a kind of a story that we um, have studied e looking at the literatures from the 1990s. I did not believe that that was continuing to happen. But when I did my field work, it was to my surprise, that was quite a prevalent characteristic. And that characteristic was very much down to the lower middle class families. And that was a very interesting isolation of fact to see in one hand, there is a bigger narrative that those kind of, you know, segregation of food consumption right is no longer in practice. But when you go down to the social strata within which food gets defined and divided, you start to see a different reality. So the ethics is then a very important question because ethics is something that we can also pull all the way to the end to say which is a crime and which is not a crime. And this is a kind of a and social construct of ethics also gives instrument to the lens of public choice theory, as I mentioned earlier, who can take this to the point that I say it is the right of a woman, regardless of her, their marital status, to have the same quantity of food. And if the food is not provided to them or allowed to um, be accessed by them, it can be a criminal offense. This is a kind of similar question that goes into where food waste or um, food uh, reduction, any of those ethical choice that we make to extend to say I am better than the other is also very much goes down to the axiom of what I can do given what position within the political economic strata I am in and the, the other part is that to what extent there is a regulatory framework that will uphold my right. And ethics is in between that is, is very much of a def, definition of the privilege sometimes, but not always. And that's why we are always fighting to have a different version of the reality. Thanks. Thank you, Marisa. And I'd like to ask Helen to come in on this as well and help you back on this after we finish the time. <laughs> Yeah, just very briefly, I want to um, follow up a bit on, on, on what Nazi has just been saying, um, getting back to the piece of the question that was about that was about privilege and about individual choice and, and what role does that play um, in thinking about a just food system. And I think that's why in my comments, I suggested that, yeah, there are there are things that we can do as individuals that we should be doing if we have the ability to do. Um, but we should also be making demands on uh, the institutions that are ostensibly supposed to be um, um, helping make, uh, you know, those opportunities available to all. So, for example, our, our national governments. And so there really is a role um, that goes far beyond individual choices in terms of uh, demanding a, a political system that does better, basically. Great. Thank you, Helen. Um, we actually have a next question, which is also for you, which is that um, many seed companies in the USA have focused on including heirloom varieties available for us to purchase for our home gardens and many farm stands now sell heirloom varieties of tomatoes and so on. Supermarkets often include heirloom varieties of crops on their produce shelves. Of course, they are often more expensive than the other varieties sold. I actually thought there was a trend to expand crop diversity this way to meet increasing demand for diversity. Can you please comment on this? 
Is that all right? Can you take Sorry, I, I actually had a little bit of trouble hearing. If you could just give me the, the, the last, the question bit again. The question bit was, could you comment on the extensions of Alien Horizon that are available to customers and consumers and supermarkets? The, the question, I think, is can um, meet increasing consumer demand for it? Okay, I think the, the question, if I've got it, is about um, the, the availability of and the interest in heirloom varieties um, and, and what maybe the kind of politics and environmental um, aspects of that uh, may be. Yeah, I, I think um, I, I feel torn a bit here. I grow um, a lot of heritage varieties myself um, in my garden and um, uh, uh, there's certainly a strong pull towards exploring the tastes and flavors of the past which seem to produce a kind of contrast for us to what's often offered in uh, supermarket shelves and, and, and um, uh, even in uh, uh, most restaurants. Um, and so that is definitely all to the good. I think there's a danger of looking to the past with respect to food crops and not necessarily looking um, forward to what breeders could be producing with the tools they have in hand. And so Andrew has made it very clear um, the environmental impact of um, uh, you know, expansive agriculture. We need crops that produce as much as they can uh, produce. And so really the ideal is finding a way to incorporate some of the qualities we've been missing out on in our industrial crop plants um, but bringing those forward into the future into varieties that are also productive, right? Because we can't risk losing productivity because that has environmental consequences as well. So, you know, it's about, it's about trying to find the balance, really. Great. Thanks for that, Helen. Um, I have another one for Andrew, which is about the environmental impact of ruminants. Um, so the environmental impact of ruminants is highly variable and dependent on production methods. Uh, and the questioner would be interested to hear if that could be a route to achieve significant improvements. Uh, yeah, so that's absolutely right. Uh, different ruminant production systems do vary in their footprints quite a lot. Um, uh, we've been doing quite a bit of work with, uh, with uh, livestock and uh, dairy producers looking at that. Um, uh, and really, Two things. It does mean that there are ways. Uh, two, two things I'd like to say. What, what, one is that um, it does mean there are ways uh, of uh, producing whatever ruminant products we do want uh, at lower cost to the environment. Uh, interestingly, and this is uh, perhaps picking up on the ethical question from earlier on, those um, uh, those systems which are extensive, which we might think of as being better for the planet are often worse in terms of almost all environmental indicators that we can assess. So for instance, the greenhouse gas footprint of uh, organically uh, produced milk in this country is two times more time, at least double that of conventionally produced milk. Um, so it, as is its amount of soil loss, as is its amount of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus waste into water um, uh, per liter of milk produced. So if you want to have a low footprint liter of milk, at least in terms of those kind of metrics, you should um, uh, perhaps go for a uh, more conventional rather than uh, what you might perhaps think of as being a, a more environmentally friendly, friendly, fr friendly way of those things being produced. So there is a variety of footprints, but it tends to point towards higher intensity systems having uh, l uh, a lower uh, footprint. There are interesting welfare questions that that potentially uh, raises, but again, we, uh, we've got um, uh, with the vet school here, we're doing some work on animal welfare across different systems. And sometimes those intensive systems can actually be pretty good for animal welfare um, because it's in the farmer's interest to look after their livestock uh, well, uh, wh wherever they are. Uh, and sometimes systems are high yielding because they're animals, in part because their animals are healthy. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind, though, is that even though there is tremendous variation within ruminant production efficiencies, Nevertheless, even the most efficient ones are substantially more costly to the planet in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, land use, water use, than are almost all uh, plant-based alternatives. That's not saying that uh, we should not eat meat at all. I eat meat, um, I eat ruminant meat, or eat ruminant products once in a while, uh, but we just uh, need to think very seriously about whether we need to eat anywhere near as much as we're currently eating. Good question though, very important question. <laughs> 
Thank you, Anthony. And I have two questions I would like to squeeze in before the end. We've got two minutes, so I'm going to ask for some very swift answers. I hope that's okay. So this one for Nazia. Considering the significance of food to culture, I'd be curious to hear more about concepts of food sovereignty and food justice in relation to discussions on food security choice and the consolidation and collapsing of seed diversity, including for indigenous food systems. That's a really big question and a very good <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I actually had a couple of years ago a student who did a, um, a master's uh, a thesis on this topic. Um, so I will try to just summarize uh, what we found and, and something that might be more relevant to what we're discussing. And um, so food sovereignty is uh, very much on the concept of looking at how independent you are in terms of the food requirement that you have, and which I was uh, alluding to the fact when I was talking about the export import imbalance that countries often get into when they're focusing on very much on a high yield crop, uh, sorry, high value crop versus um, crops that are going to be more uh, nutritious and available for the rest of the population. Um, a lot of the case studies that we find in developing countries who are also leaders in international uh, food trade system happen to have a very large uh, import um, import bias towards uh, imported food. And this is where food sovereignty comes in, is that how independent are you? And it is a very important question now when we're looking at uh, food resilience, and that is very much onto the context of how resilient your food system is really to withhold the shock and be able to transform overnight pretty much to uh, maintain the healthy um, eating um, uh, balance for your population. Um, but the Lebanese example is a very interesting one if you're thinking about food sovereignty. When the uh, the silo blew up and that was the only and the major food silo that was on the uh, border of the um, uh, the airport and the, it, the country basically just collapsed to its uh, need to uh, to uh, uh, supply the uh, uh, wheat that the nation, nation need for its own population. And that's the kind of food sovereignty uh, discussion gets into the, the ability to actually diversify its main or the critical food source when it comes to crisis. And food justice, I already talked about the ethics point of view, and it's it's a very big philosophical well, topic. Yeah. That I we have about. 30 Thank seconds you. left, so I'm going to need to stop you there. Last question would have been love grown meats. I don't think we have time, but I think it's been a great one. Um, I'd like to sum up by saying thank you very much for all of your perspectives. It's been fascinating for me to hear about all of these topics, all of you. Um, there are many, many more questions than we have time for. So thank you, all of the audience, for your insights and attention for listening to this today and addressing this uh, in your own lives. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.